This week, we welcome Mark Dufresne, Vice President of Threat Research at Endgame, for an interview. We're going to be talking about the MITRE ATT&CK framework, so stay tuned for that. In our second feature interview this evening, we welcome John Walsh, a DevOps evangelist at CyberArk. We're going to talk about their Conjure open source project, the uh, open source community around it, and all things about vaulting for applications. In the security news, how to use the Shodan search engine to secure an enterprise's internet presence, Apache access vulnerabilities, uh, or a vulnerability rather, vulnerable controllers could allow attackers to manipulate marine diesel engines, ICS, this just in, ICS security is played with basic avoidable mistakes. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. NetSparker, the developers of desktop and cloud-based web application security scanners that enable you to automatically identify vulnerabilities in your web applications and web services. NetSparker scanners employ a unique and dead accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities with their proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at netsparker.com or email at contact at netsparker.com. Today's determined attackers easily bypass even the most advanced network defenses. Trying to ramp up staff to detect their back doors can cost thousands of dollars in take months, even years. With Active Countermeasures AI Hunter, we enable junior analysts to detect even the most advanced backdoors in a matter of hours. Sign up for a demo and purchase our product today by visiting activecountermeasures.com forward slash PSW. Active Countermeasures, make every analyst a hunter. Despite the restraining order, Paul Asadorian is back in your house right now. Paul. Whoa. Thanks, Doug. Well, oh, sorry. I hate it when podcast hosts do the talk with a cigar in their mouth. Welcome to Paul Security Weekly. This is episode 579, recorded on October 18th, 2018. We're, of course, here in G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island. To my left, it's the illustrious Dr. Doug White. Hello. What's going on? Oh, I'm, I'm here. I'm back on Security Weekly. I'm, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad you're here. Yeah. I'm like... It's going to be fun. Keep coming back like a rash. It's a <laughs> I do have a rash that actually keeps coming back. <laughs> See? I just I keep getting poison. I can't. The poison ivy, man. It's terrible. It's terrible. Some people do that willingly, but no. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there's a site for that. Pe- like there's people out else. on the edge, you know. That's right. That's that's <laughs> they're out on the edge. Uh, on the lines uh, via Skype or Zoom or one of them, Mr. Carlos Perez is here. Welcome, Carlos. Hey, Paul. Happy to be here with you. You sound it's excited, Carlos. Not really, <laughs> but it's been a long week. Huh? You sound you sound tired. Oh yeah. <laughs> Alrighty. Also on the lines, Mr. Jeff Mann is here. Hey, Paul. Hey, good to see Carlos for change and Doug in the studio. I am fresh back from Atlanta, where I was speaking at the ISSA International Conference, and I've got a story to tell about uh, an evening I spent last night with uh, one of our friends, Joe Gray. So stay tuned for the uh, news segment. Mm. Anxiously awaiting that. Also, Mr. Joff Fire is here wel- with us. Welcome, Joff. Hey, good evening. It's Thursday again. Uh, we need to pep it up. A little excitement here. <laughs> Carlos is like... Uh, how's it going? Just like, eh, well, I got this thing. No, no, it's Thursday night. Let's have some fun. It's Security Weekly. Well, it could be Stoner Weekly. You, you Stoner obviously Security got your Weekly. power back on, right, Jeff? Yeah, Jeff has yeah. power this week. You got yeah, the so power. Yes, I'm coming to, you, coming to you from Hurricane Ravage, North Carolina, where I was without power for 48 hours. Oof. But uh, it, was, uh, it was rough, but I did have a generator, run the beer fridge and stuff. So That's important. Good. The important things. Yeah. Uh, 48 hours. <laughs> If you're interested, in, yeah. <laughs> Carlos is like, that's Ouch. not yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, you said like months. 48, hours. He's like, like, 48 <laughs> months. Or? Carlos like, I still am running on generator power. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, quality over quantity and have meaningful in and having meaningful conversations instead of just a badge scan, join us. That's right. We'll be there. 
at this conference, April 1st through the 3rd at uh, 2019 at Disney's Contemporary Resort I- for InfoSec World 2019, where if I don't mess up my teleprompter, uh, I can tell you that you can connect and network with like-minded pr- individuals in search of actionable information. Use the registration code, which is really a discount code, os 19 sec week S E C W E E K O S 19 dash sec week. And that gets you 15% off the main conference or a world pass. You should be there because we're going to have a lot of fun in yeah. Orlando. We Good did clean fun time. in Orlando. It's Disney, right? Yeah, you guys fun. were just there for Microsoft Ignite. We were just there for Microsoft Ignite, and it was fun for that. They had Universal, though, so yes, Microsoft true. Yes. rented Universal Studios, which was also interesting. Mm. I heard you guys walked a lot. We walked a lot. We didn't We didn't partake of butter beer. It was the nastiest looking thing. It was like some kind of sludge in a cooler, and I was like, it's free, but I'm not taking it. No way. I don't care if Harry Potter drinks it. I'm not touching it. Mm, I did try to get Mark to eat like 20 hot dogs and get on some kind of whirling ride so we could see what kind of, you know, like oh, that'd be awesome. colorful Should splashes we could get. Except he's the camera guy, so. I know. That was the whole problem with it. And I was like, <laughs> Mark, no you have there. to film yourself vomiting on the ride. Come <laughs> on. <laughs> Oh, boy. Uh, So I'd like to introduce our uh, first guest for this evening, Mark Dufresne, who is the Vice President of Threat Research at Endgame. He's responsible for Endgame's efforts to understand cyber threats and develop capabilities to detect and prevent malicious adversary techniques. Mark, welcome to the program. All right. Thanks for having me. Nice to have you. So, Mark... um, I guess, I mean, I think a lot of our listeners know about the MITRE attack framework, but I feel like it's not as widely known as, uh, you know, some things might be in security. So you could start, Mark, by uh, telling us uh, what, why MITRE created this and uh, what the MITRE attack framework is. Yeah, sure. So I would say we didn't really have a common language to describe what attackers actually did once they got in a box. Um, you're probably all, you know, you're familiar with the like Lockheed Martin kill chain, which was really popular a couple years ago. And, you know, we'll still all talk about that once in a while, but that wasn't really, in, you know, in our opinion, in MITRE's opinion, like detailed enough to really be actionable in any way. So what MITRE tried to do, and we, and we think it's a great thing that they've done, and uh, there's a lot of momentum behind it now, is, is try to break the you know, adversaries, primarily their post-compromise actions. So things like, you know, what do they do once they land on a box? They um, you know, try to persist on that box. They try to evade the defenses that are there. They might try to look around. And then eventually, you know, what are their actions on objectives, exfilling data or whatever it is they're going to do? So they've done a really nice job providing a, a mapping of, of a, a nice universe of techniques that have been observed, used by adversaries you know, in past attacks. Uh, so, you know, we use it at Endgame in a lot of different ways. It, it guides some of our activities. We think it's the best, kind of the best mapping that's out there right now for this sort of thing. Yeah, it's interesting, Mark. There's a lot of <clears throat> guidelines, standards, frameworks that we see. I mean, a lot of us have been in security for a really long time. Um, uh, Doug and Jeff, a really, really long time. Sorry, <laughs> Since I had, before I had to it was called <clears throat> security. I had to qualify that. Um, why, like, does the attack framework live up to the hype? Is there like, is it really being adopted? Is this really good compared to the like smattering and just plethora of other standards, frameworks, and guidelines? Yeah, I mean, I think it lives up to the hype. Most of it, anyway. I, I think it's it has gotten a lot of hype. I mean, at um, at DerbyCon a couple of years ago, we were just starting to talk about that. This year, it was just like it seems like half the talks were about attack matrix and how to yeah. how to action that. So it's almost it's sort of. Um, there's becoming some risk almost of that just becoming another em- a buzzword that has, you know, again, could be used in like empty ways and all of a sudden it's rendered meaningless because it's so popular. But um, we really think there are, are useful ways to use that, but it, it probably does have some limitations like any framework does. Yeah. And Mark, what, in your opinion, what, what are the, the, the limitations to the framework? Yeah. Um, so, well, I mean, just for example, I mentioned earlier, we use it to guide some of our activities at Endgame, not all. I mean, like, for example, we put a lot of energy into uh, some really good machine learning based malware classification on my team. I, you know, I don't need the attack mates to tell me that that's something I should do. Mm. We're just going to go ahead and do that. Um, uh, you know, another thing we started to see a little bit of energy around is, is attribution with the attack framework, because MITRE has done, you know, really almost as a way to to provide references for some of the techniques. They've mapped a given technique to where it's been observed being used by an adversary in the past. But, you know, I, I don't tend to put a lot of stock into that. You know, it's it's kind of nice to see what techniques have been used by what actors historically. But, I, you know, that that information is quite fragmentary and certainly not a good way to, like, 
predict what a threat group's going to do in your network or attributing an observed attack chain to like a specific adversary. So, you know, those are some limitations. And there's some other ones that there's a lot of, um, some of the cells are pretty nonspecific and not, again, not particularly actionable. Like, um, I mean, what would be a good one there? Um, I mean, just a lot of them tend to be really noisy and like we have to dig in a little more to, to like sub techniques. I guess one example of that might be, you know, process injection. There's about a, you know, dozens of ways, you know, a dozen plus ways you can do that depending on how you count them. Um, so just saying, hey, attackers might inject into processes. Um, you need a lot more fidelity to try to address that. And I think on that latter point, MITRE is planning on doing some things to address that and add some more granularity to, to some of those types of techniques. My concern with the, in the category of limitations is... Anytime we start to adopt a standard or framework or guideline, there tends to be, as is the case, I'll say it first, PCI, that, uh, you know, people say, well, I'm, I'm PCI compliant, therefore I'm secure. And I think we're starting to see this with the MITRE ATT&CK framework, where organizations are like, well, I'm, I'm doing really good in my MITRE ATT&CK framework and detecting all of those, those vectors, like I'm secure. Right. And, and Mark, obviously that's the case. And, you know, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on how that's been going specifically with this framework. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the DLL and uh, shellcode injection is another is like a good example of that, because you might say, hey, we're, we're good on on uh, on process injection detection. We can detect like reflective DLL loading. But again, you say then you tell your boss, hey, we're green on this. We don't have to worry about this. And all of a sudden you, you're totally blind to every other technique and mm. uh, putting no energy into to solving those problems. So, yeah, I mean, I think, again, that is like the, the whole question of how do you measure against the TAC is a good one. And there's not a lot of consensus around that. Um, and then, like, what does done mean is, is really an open question, too. But, I mean, those limitations aside, it, it does remain probably the most useful way to start, like, thinking about, hey, I've, what do I have the data I need to do my job? And, um, you, know, where, you know, where do I have gaps and which gaps should I try to address with focused activities to get more data, write more analytics, and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's limited, but it, it's, it's pretty, pretty useful. I, I think it's a great starting point and uh, in a tool for uh, folks to use. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, I. it's funny. I, when I was at ISSA this week, I, I had a couple conversations, people asking about the attack framework, and I had to confess that even though we've talked about it on the show, I haven't actually dug into it yet. Uh, but I, I guess a basic question that I have uh, is, um, you know, who, who's the target audience? Who, who, who you know, before we either answer the question, how how well is the framework being adopted? Who actually would benefit from it? Who who is the ideal audience or user that would benefit from looking at the attack framework? Yeah, I think the immediate set of people who it's useful for is just the you know the blue team, the SOC, the people doing the day to day work to again measure it. Hey, do I, you know, do I have the data I need? And, you know, do I have coverage that I need? And do we have to address some of these gaps as like a daily tool? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think there, you know, there's some energy around trying to make it actionable for executives who, I mean, they're always just sitting around and asking the folks in the SOC, like, hey, are we good? Are we good? Are we good? And how do they know if we're good? And um, coverage of uh, coverage across attack is becoming a way that we're trying to that I think practitioners are trying to communicate to management, like, hey, yeah, we're good or we're not good and we need investment in these areas. Mm. And, and I, one thing I, I would Go say is, is we have to be careful that these don't become discrete kind of mm. approaches where it's just like, okay, box checked. Uh, like Mark was saying, that it's, it's very easy to just say, we did this, we're good, we don't need to look at it anymore. And, and I know that, that, that Mark and Endgame are not doing that kind of thing, but when companies start adopting this, you have to be careful that it doesn't become that discrete event that's just like, yes, done, yeah. and you don't think about it anymore. And that's what Mark was saying as well about, about that kind of thing. Well, that sort of begs sort of part B of the question is, and we've talked about this in other contexts uh, before on the show of, uh, you know, what kind of qualifications or maturity level do people need to have to yeah. be able to benefit from the, from the framework? For instance, to, be, to know not to stop with it and, and not to think, okay, I've checked all these things and we're done. Uh, sort of part B to that question, does the framework, and I promise I am going to study it once I get off the road in the next couple of weeks, uh, does it lend itself to teaching people, teaching the Sox and the Blue Teams, um, you know, methodologies, types of things to look for over and above the specific things that uh, it apparently identifies? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think it it identifies a set of things to look for. Um, the mm -hmm. I think it's useful. I mean, it's you know it's most actionable by people with a little bit of sophistication because you do. You know, if you're running your own program and your own data collection, you have to have a certain amount of sophistication to get the right data, organize it, and make it queryable. Um, and then you can go start asking questions like, you know, hey, can I see malicious use of Reg Server 32? And hey, what's my coverage of, of malicious uses of PowerShell? And can I see new services being created? Ask, that's all the types of question that these atomic units of attack um, give you. Um, you know, we, we try pretty hard at Endgame to try to make it um, accessible to, to even folks with less experience. And so we're doing things to try to try to help answer the, hey, am I good question by like, you know, simple stuff like, you know, if you get an alert in our platform, we'll tell you what technique ID it's associated with and link you to MITRE uh, for some more background information on that technique. So, you know, if you don't know why you should care about Red Server 32 doing, uh, doing things on your network, you click and you're, you can get to some references and try to help educate people with a little bit less experience um, through the tooling and, and kind of make that labeling and, uh, and information gathering easy. Yeah, Mark, what are some of the other ways Endgame's using the, the framework? Um, I'm curious to, to kind of hear the reception and reaction from, you know, the endpoint uh, subsection of the security industry and, and also how you're, you're using that uh, for customer benefit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is it, the educational benefit I just mentioned is huge. Um, the, you know, a lot of customers do ask us like, you know, you know, buyers aren't always there's a huge variation of like level of sophistication. You get you know, some buyers who are very are kind of more familiar with just traditional AV and they're not, you know, they're not quite sure how to test maybe a, a more advanced product with a lot of additional functionality and EDR capabilities uh, kind of layered in. Um, so, you know, we use attack to help you know, we and one thing we did actually is take our internal testing framework for some of our analytics um, called Red Team Automation, and we open sourced the thing to help you know, like the help testers and even just any user in a, a company. You don't need to be an Endgame customer to use this thing, but it's a pi, it's a, a like a Python framework to um, generate activity on your systems that uh, corresponds to attack cells, and then you can measure. Uh, you know, kind of measure your detection capabilities there. So start to like, you know, give your blue teams kind of something to chew on. And there's a couple other great frameworks. Red Canary's got one that we really like a lot called Red Team Automation. Um, Uber released something called Meta that's really good to try to emulate, like kind of map different activities of attack, make it easy for somebody to click a button and use it. So, and we've done a, kind of a lot of things like that. Again, a lot of it on the accessibility front. And then, you know, internal to my team, again, we, we you know, we, uh, we think about attack every day and we think about our coverage. Um, you know, do we have the right data to answer these questions? And do we, um, do we provide the right alerting um, around these sorts of techniques that are, you know, fault, very low false positive things that will just land in somebody's alerts queue right alongside a malware alert. You know, it, it's interesting and <clears throat> not to get kind of philosophical on you, Mark, but when uh, there, it comes about a framework like this, right? And what I've observed <clears throat> with this particular framework is that so many different organizations, so you mentioned Uber, uh, security vendors, uh, and, and even just someone who had the motivation to go create uh, an open source project, all started creating open source software to support this framework. And I think that's kind of interesting. Uh, how do you believe that kind of impacts our industry and either, uh, you know, aids defenders or maybe helps attackers? Because it, it could be a double-edged sword, perhaps. Like, what's your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point. I mean, maybe attackers would um, could make an assumption like, okay, these are... Let's assume that if it's an attack and it's a technique or a, a sub-technique, when those start to come out, maybe defenders are well equipped against those. Uh, so maybe in attack matrix is always evolving. You know, we see a MITRE updating this thing on a pretty regular cadence. You know, maybe they would use a technique that's that's not covered there. I never thought of that before. Uh, that that could be part of a double-edged sword. Um, but again, you know, I, I think the the universe of the number of ways to do things on on boxes once you get access is limited. So I, you know, this taxonomy is still a massive force for good. Um, mm. to guide defenders to, you know, have better defensive programs and do a better job setting up like layered defenses against the uh, in intrusion. Uh, how does this, you know, speak to visibility, Mark, in, in the organization? And I think we throw that term around so often, uh, specifically in the security industry side of the house, right? And, you know, you yeah. ask, uh, I ask some people, uh, there were certain vendors, you know, like, what's the problem you solve? And they'll come back and say visibility. I'm like, Okay, that's that's nice. That's that's nice. Like I, I, I think I, I understand where you're going, but 
uh, I'll put some context around that. What do you mean visibility into what and visibility yeah. by whom into what? Yeah. So in, in this context, you know, kind of define visibility for us. Yeah, that's great. You know, for me as a vendor, you know, the question we get a lot, you know, people look at attack and again, they want to answer the, am I good question? So a lot of the, a lot of their ideas, cause it's what they're used to is, you know, give me my pane of glass with all my alerts and like, Hey, do you alert across 100% of attack? And the answer is absolutely not because you know, I can't be generating alerts off my endpoint every time somebody creates a scheduled task or every time somebody you know, runs task list on an endpoint to get some enumeration. Like there's, there's some things in attack that you can create a high confidence detection for mm -hmm. and alert on. And uh, you know we do that for a pretty large chunk of attack. And there's other things that that would be an insane thing to do in production. It would false positive like crazy and they would kick end game to the curb and, and you know just throw us out because they can't deal with that. Uh, so we don't do that. And, but instead, it does get to the visibility question, which um, for us as an endpoint uh, product, we're, we're constantly gathering, you know, full visibility on all process execution events, you know, DNS activity, um, what's the network, do, you know, what is that box doing in the network, file rights, registry rights, modifications, uh, image loads, all kinds of stuff that we're getting in real time on our endpoint. And visibility is all about making the data available for the user of the platform uh, to ask the right questions of their data uh, to, to find evidence of these attack cells uh, having you know, been sort of tickled by the adversary. So again, folks aren't as familiar with attack. There are lots of things in here. Um, and the, the discovery tactic is a really good one. It's like, it, you know, is somebody you know, querying registry? The, the attackers sometimes use reg.exe to go uh, query the registry. So do we have command line eventing that you can see what's happening in the registry? Um, it like uh, net use commands being run as they're trying to enumerate, um, you know, that sort of thing. And there's, there's things like that where we provide the visibility and a really easy way to ask questions of the data in order to, uh, you know, to, to get to the answer. Uh, does that make sense? The, mm. the kind of, it's, I think that detections versus visibility is a really important distinction. Mm. Absolutely. Carlos, you're noticeably quiet over there. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, he's still sore about uh, job getting every, power back in 48 hours I think yeah. my only problem that I have had with MITRE and some of the tools that have been released as open source is that I've actually seen customers just simply go like uh, we don't need a pen test we ran this tool, we're okay we're detecting yeah. everything that is there mm -hmm. um, and actually uh, heard about a couple of reports where uh, some of the tabletop exercises for just running this tool and giving a, a blank stamp of approval to a blue team that they're covering everything. So, uh, but that's bound to happen. People won't have the proper knowledge or context to use it. And there's always going to be, uh, uneducated people using it. Mm -hmm. well, it reminds me a little bit of teaching to the test, you know, in our school systems where so much of the education system and, and funding and, and whatnot is based on, you know, standardized test scores. So the teachers end up only teaching what they know is going to be on the test and missing out on a whole lot of other, yep. you know, wonderful educational opportunities. Yeah, yeah, I we've seen that a couple of times too. It's folks, I mean, we've tried to use this as like examples of ways, you know, ways to look, think about post compromise detection. I totally agree that a, that it does not simulate a pen test in any way, shape, or form, and it just it's totally lacking the like a level of creativity. I mean, some of the frameworks have started to you know chain an attack together, but it's still just you know it's like a it's just a run a script and it'll do five things. And yeah, I think that is a it's a huge risk of attack is is misuse of attack in that way. Yeah, and, and so Mark, you, you mentioned earlier that Mitre's, uh, you know, updating the framework, and as we know, there's new attack vectors all the time. Uh, can you give us some insights into Endgame's process, you know, given your position in the company, as to uh, how you're updating your product for, for new attack vectors, how you're discovering them, and, and what the update process uh, kind of looks like? Yeah, sure. I mean, we so we kind of have a, you know, our endpoint you know, has a pretty robust set of data to provide that visibility already. And we've built a, a very easily um, updatable framework for our detections that can support additions of new techniques. So we're watching, um, you know, we're watching attack. We're watching, I mean, like everybody else, um, as folks like, um, you know, Casey Smith and other, other great researchers like that are posting techniques. 
Um, sometimes they're usually kind of a head of attack. Miter mm. will bring that stuff in a little later. Um, it's certainly not the only way that we're bringing in new detections. And frankly, it's, it's probably not even a primary way that we're bringing in new, like new techniques that we may not have otherwise been aware of just because there's a delay in getting it into Miter. Um, it's, it's more, um, it's more good for us to have like a kind of a, a it's a good reference for us um, as we create a detection, again, to provide an educational resource for customers and provide context for, for our users um, as they're using our platform. And um, of course, we, you know, we do get the questions from customers like, hey, what is your coverage? And we you know, try to provide a, a good nuanced answer back to questions like that. Um, so it's, it's not really, a, you know, to the point of like teaching to the test, we don't really use it in that way. Um, it's more of like a measurement and educational tool for us in a way for us to talk to customers to like contextualize what it is that we're doing in a, in a decent part of our product, which is the, the post compromise portion of our product. Absolutely. Yeah. In the testing process, I'm sure is hard. Like, how do you know? how you're detecting a particular technique in a, in a given circumstance. And we talked about the, the open source tools for detecting these. And, you know, in your experience, Mark, like what's the difference between something that tries to emulate an attack versus infecting something with actual malware? Is there some validity, you know, to some of the claims yeah. where there might be a stark contrast between those two? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the whole concept of testing and measuring is a, I think it's an unsolved problem. Uh, I don't, I don't think any of us would say that any, I don't want to get into the whole, uh, you know, morass of like the, the testing, but I guess the, a lot of the, um, the pay for testing remains basically malware testing and exploit testing, the, the, that, you know, prevention testing, that's more akin to a regular AV product. And, you know, we, we tend to do great on that type of testing with malware and exploit prevention and all kinds of stuff that's set up. Um, the, Measurement and testing for post compromise stuff is a lot less mature. Um, MITRE, uh, MITRE has embarked upon an evaluation of different vendor technologies that Endgame has been a part of, um, you know, and results for that testing. I, th I think they've announced that it's coming out in you know a few weeks time where they'll put out um, kind of their a some kind of information um, about how different products provided visibility and, and detection across attacks. So we'll see kind of how that shakes out. Um, probably won't be the end state for what we need to be doing to, to try to provide like an unbiased third party evaluation uh, of these sorts of technologies. Yeah, I, I find that very interesting, Mark. In, I, I, I won't invalidate the entire process, right? But I think what's important for our audience to understand is that anytime you're measuring the d detection and measuring based on like how much it detects and, and those types of measurements. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I come from the vulnerability management background, right? very similar in the way that we were compared. Like, how many vulnerabilities do you find versus how many vulnerabilities do you find, right? And I, I used to think that was a bigger deal than it was. Mark, what are some of the other things that our audience can do to incorporate inside their evaluations? You know, my attack framework being, being one, how, many, how much stuff that you can detect, but what are the other things, Mark, that you want our audience to consider when they're doing these evaluations? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think a big one is just the audience. Um, it, there's going to have to be a nuanced read of any kind of results, whether they're internally generated uh, and and externally. Just again, because we can't have a situation like, uh, hey, there's a there's a data compressed section of attack. Um, if we can't say that a product that sends me an alert every time somebody runs zip from the command line, we can't say that product is better because it alerted. Yeah. Well, like in game only lets me have visibility on the command lines uh, or like file system activity of zip files. Like I would say our ours is better, but you could actually actually uh, have a, a crappy test framework done that gives more credit. For, yeah. Uh, like an alerting detection. So I think just trying people that are consuming attack and we touched on it a couple of times in this conversation, there is you know quite a bit of nuance required to, to not uh, kind of um, you know trip over yourself as you're trying to use this particular framework and and make decisions based on this framework. Yeah, and I think also, Mark, you know, uh, usability features, uh, operational efficiency, and integrations are, are like three other really big points, right? That I don't know if you can speak to, to some of those in uh, you know Endgame's case and relate to our audience about some of those, you know, even other things that they should mm -hmm. consider, right? Because those things yeah. are important. Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of does speak as you're talking, you know, 
part of what our product does is, yeah, we'll, we'll provide lots of really high confidence alerts, but if it's not a prevention, like if you said, hey, I just want to be in detect mode for malware, for example, you can do that with Endgame. Um, it, our policy configurations are very flexible. You're going to want to know what something did after it executed and, uh, and try to get what, is mat what matters here, what's security relevant. So, um, you know, in terms of enrichments and things and integration with attack, we're, we're trying to provide as much enrichment and, um, and integration as we can with attack to say, hey, this thing, you know, maybe it, it executed 12 child processes with these command lines and wrote these files and reached out to the internet and then loaded this library and did something. We're trying to like analyze that data for the user and try to identify as much security relevant stuff happening associated with that attack context mapped to attack to help the user kind of answer that, well, what the hell am I supposed to do about this now? Mm. Uh, which is a problem that um, we, we don't think anyone's done a very good job yet of solving. And it's a thing that my research team is investing pretty heavily in is that, well, okay, I got, I got alerts. Endgame generates great alerts. And I, I think a, a reasonable, you know, a, a very high signal to noise ratio in those alerts. Uh, we put a lot of time into that, but it's the, um, we're, we're answering also the, what do I do about this question, which is just something that's really a, you know, talk about a high barrier to entry for teams. And, you know, that's, that's a pretty big deal out there. So we're trying to use MITRE as part of our solution to that problem. And I think that's a great validation validation point, Mark, that you may not have realized that you just disseminated to our audience. And that is, you know, when you're a security vendor and you're hearing feedback from your customers going, yeah, like we're, we're liking the product and we're running it, but we're getting so much information or, or, you know, we're getting this specific information and like now we don't know how to process it all, right? That's a testament that your product's doing the job it should and you're pushing your customers to start tackle the next problem, which is how do I respond and operationalize all this stuff, right? I mean, and that's is, is essentially what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's really awesome. And another thing is that when we look at the framework, the framework actually defines a series of attack in a very basic way. And many times what you can actually see uh, out there is that people will run all of these tools that run the attack one way and just any regular attacker with a bit of modification, uh, on obfuscation, encoding, uh, just modifying a bit some of the parameters instead of going HTTP, let's use FTP uh, for this URI. And now you've bypassed uh, mm -hmm. some of the checks of some of the tools. So yep. uh, it's not to describe the framework to solve the, fr the framework's great, but people need to understand that it was it's actually providing us a baseline. And when it comes to metrics, the way I've learned to, uh, about metrics uh, across my life, the art way is that every environment is going to have different metrics from one to the other. Mm -hmm. Each yep. environment will define their own metrics depending on their own business needs on their own capabilities. Uh, but at the very least, the what I like about MITRE is that it's actually providing that initial practical baseline that can actually be used. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And then you start, again, it's the nuance. You start to think about, um, you know, you're like renaming a tool or doing something. Like it's pretty important to be res having your data visibility, you know, not only be like, you got to have your data be hardened that, and I think that's an input into visibility. Like, is this easily bypassable? Like, can I just change the name of, of W script and, you know, bring my own version and, you know, call it XYZ.exe and then bypass everything that I'm doing in my, my blue team. That's looking at, um, looking for just W script.exe running. We, I mean, we, we have a lot of things in our product to help, um, help provide some visibility into those sorts of evasions, but not, Again, an unsophisticated user of attack is going to run in exactly to what you just talked about, Carlos, which is not not be resilient against those sorts of things. Mark, are, are there other things you wanted to uh, speak to our audience about? And uh, also, you know, any uh, kind of future enhancements or things you might be working on or feedback you want to solicit? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think we covered a lot of really valuable ground here. Um, and I guess a couple of things that we, you know, we've got cooking an end game um, and what we've had it in our product for a long time is, is just, um, you know, you hunting and post compromise detection. Again, it's super important, but you know, the MITRE attack framework maybe isn't the end all be all it's there's things like, well, how in the world do I find like in memory threats, you know, things that might, that might have successfully injected code into my environment and be are running in a, in a way that's evading all my defenses. How do I find, 
things that are executing in the context of some of those, you know, injected threads. So, you know, we've got a lot of capabilities like that when it comes to post-compromise detection that, you know, we, we think users shouldn't get too, uh, too um, focused on just attack solving that whole problem. Um, the other thing that we've done at Endgame is, you know, we, there's not really a great language to describe um, the analytics that you need to, to, dis to um, detect these sorts of, of cells. So we've, um, you know, we created our own language. It's, it, it's a programming language, uh, but a very simple one that um, people who have done Boolean logic will have a pretty easy time with called event query language. We've, we've uh, done an initial blog post on that. Um, we're looking forward to being at the MITRE attack con next week. Uh, that you know, I think it's uh, it's here in the DC area, and I think it's going to be streamed for your viewers. I would really mm. encourage people to check that out. I think you can still register to uh, go on the the web stream for AttackCon. Um, we'll be doing um, you know you know a lightning talk there about how you can use uh, EQL to develop robust um, uh, detections, and we'll probably put out some more material on our blog about EQL. There's a post there now if folks want to go read about it, which is really good stuff. Um, and we're also at AttackCon. Uh, Devin Kerr is doing a pa uh, talk on how a little more information on how vendors are using attacks. So, you know, we've we got a presence there. There's a lot of other good stuff there. So I, I would say if people are interested in not just Endgame, but attack in general, um, MITRE's putting on a, their first attack con next week. I would encourage folks to check that out. Awesome. Awesome. Any final <coughs> questions for Mark? I'm good. I do. Yes, Jeff. Questions. Uh, and, and not necessarily for Mark. I've been sitting here listening in... You know, Paul, you brought up a certain compliance standard, and I'm reminded of the dozens of customers that I've had over the years that, um, especially in the commercial world, that basically were doing security because they had to, because they were being, you know, they're, they're being held to the fire because of some compliance standard. And there's one in particular that uh, has a lot of teeth. Um, and, and I'm sitting here trying to think about, uh, you know, from what I've heard, attack is fairly sophisticated and for a sophisticated, uh, you know, sort of high level of maturity, uh, you know, security analyst, SOC analyst, uh, you know, blue team or whatever. So I'm sitting here thinking, okay, so what about all those companies that don't have that capability? How, how is MITRE, how is anybody trying to sort of market this? uh into the into the the segment of the community that doesn't you know it doesn't have the maturity level yet and i and what i've heard i'm sort of answering my own question but i, I would love to hear commentary from mark and others is you know for those companies that don't have the sophistication like they've been doing all alone anyway they they're sort of needing to turn to, to, to security vendors and maybe to some degree security consultants, you know, pen testing firms and consultants, advisors, assessors, and things like that, who uh, in turn hopefully are familiar or are becoming familiar with the attack framework. And so, you know, it, there's almost like a secondary market for, for the attack uh, framework that I'm hearing, which is really the vendor community, and it's almost a responsibility of the vendor community if, if we all collectively agree that that the attack framework at a high level is a good thing. And and I, I from what I'm hearing, I, I would tend to agree with that assertion. Uh, but I, I'm also always trying to figure out, but how do we make more companies secure so that security is not just for the the mature companies that have the budgets to to have the socks and the blue teams. Um, so I appreciate that Endgame and hopefully other companies are taking a look at the attack framework and trying to take you know reap the benefits on behalf of customers. So I guess the question ultimately is how to how do we market uh, companies like Endgame and other companies that are trying to use you know market attack the attack framework, uh, but also market it in a way to say hey if you can't afford to you know you you look at the thing and you don't have no idea what it is. There's these companies out there that you know have your have your back have your best interests in mind and they're doing a lot with the attack framework you you should go talk to them yeah um so i would say it's again it's a it's a great educational tool is one point i would make um and i would say it's a tool that it's not just a vendor thing and i would actually say that the groundswell has been more so on the practitioner side i mean we've yeah. heard just a, for example tons of discussion in some of the isacs about using attack um, collaboration around that. So there's there's a good, um, I think it's coming from both sides, you know, and it is certainly the more sophisticated teams um, as opposed to the folks that, you know, it's one person with no budget uh, trying just to keep their head above water. It's It might be a little harder to get arms around this. 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, thing, we're, we're pretty big on the educational aspects of this. Um, you know, we put out a, we wrote a, a book on threat hunting, which some of that maps to the attack framework. And uh, we didn't market Endgame in that thing at all. We talked about how to use free tools like, you know, Sysmon and other, uh, other things to, uh, to create detections around this. So if you can just, I mean, anybody can use a free tool. Um, a lot of places you have, you know, you can have very, Training levels of success, getting data and sending it back to your sim, and you can run queries there. So, you know, we do think that there are definitely ways to, for even people with limited budgets to get started and getting started somewhere is better than um, not doing anything. So, uh, you know, I think if people are wondering where to get started, I would uh, encourage people to just dive in. There's like a whole, you know, there's a whole column on execution. So you could just measure, hey, how can I, how can I see if these various sorts of things are executing on my network? And do I have visibility into things like code signing and is, you know, all that sort of stuff. So um, we've provided some stuff up there with our threat hunting handbook um, that, um, you know, I will give it a nod, not because it's for marketing purposes, but it's actually pretty good content. You can uh, grab the threat hunting handbook from our website. Um, and there's other folks who put out similar materials and free tools. Roberto Rodriguez, Cyber War Dog has done a lot of good stuff that trying to encourage um, uh, sharing of analytics and things like that. So there's, you know, there's some ways to get started. Uh, and I would encourage people to not feel intimidated by this wall of 200 techniques that you'll never be able to touch. If you do start with 10, start with five, start with one, and, and maybe you can make some progress. Mark, is there a, a level of maturity that you could articulate that you should have before you even start looking at something like the MITRE ATT&CK framework? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would be interested in other folks' opinions, but, you know, I think other security controls like you know, good password hygiene. Uh, you know, you probably want to make sure you have decent malware protection uh, that isn't easily bypassed. Um, so there probably are some things related to just, you know, get get a few things knocked out uh, mm -hmm. before you embark on, you know, determining if you can see, you know, whether there's been, uh, you know, DLL search order hijacking on your network. I, I wouldn't start here if you're, if you got a blank slate of, um, and a really mess, you know, a total mess of lack of security controls and, and problems. Um, but I'm interested in what everyone else would think on that front. No, I, I think that last point summed it up, right? Like if you, if you don't have a yeah. security program and like you're kind of a mess, you don't want to start with the minor attack framework. It's just, just going to overwhelm with, you and yeah. you're going to be looking at all these things and feel hopeless about it because when right. you look at that, so you have to back up and go to things like, mm -hmm. like, you know, I don't know, COVID or something or control, just basic controls and say, do we have just simple, basic stuff? before you start diving into these, you know, it's yeah. great to use it to learn because you go, I don't know what this is. I'm going to yeah, go learn sure. what it is. But if you don't even know what, you know, password hygiene is, you've got bigger problems than worrying about these sophisticated attacks. Yeah. You, well, you've uh, got to have some vulnerability management and, yeah. and patching thrown in there as a kind of a, one of the steps. I yeah. think you got to have good uh, system administration and change control processes. You know, Mark's yep. point about passwords is yep. uh, absolutely spot on. Uh, you the know, top, hey, Paul, the, go ahead, the Jeff. Top the top, uh, the top five or six of the uh, CIS controls, formerly known as the SANS top 20, is yeah. exactly what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah, I agree. Right. That's a, You've got to have those. If you don't have those top five or six, yep. yeah. CIS has yeah. turned it into six yeah. these days. But if you don't have those knocked out, then you have no business, I, I think. But people do make that mistake <laughs> and, and they're all the also time. in PCI. <laughs> but they do right. make that mistake but no, all and, the time. Jeff brings up a great point, too. You know, making sure that you've got your compliance taken yeah. care of is... A higher priority, in my opinion, that you got to get done before you start looking at how do I prevent against some of these, you know, attack vectors that are being being defined. That's you got to have something to work with to to prevent these. Well, I would caveat that, Paul, with uh, not doing compliance, you know, sort of the checkbox approach, but doing compliance, looking at the PCI standard as a framework. Uh, because it covers essentially the same things sure. that the yeah. the CIS top twenty or the NIST cybersecurity framework covers. I mean, basic security hygiene is basic security hygiene. But you know, Mark's touching on what I, I think sort of a, a subtopic of this whole marketing issue. When you when you you know, if you're not doing the very basics uh, and you're only doing what's required, and you have this compliance attitude about doing, you know, whatever bare minimum of security. In fact, I would even say, if your attitude is, "What's the bare minimum I need to do for security?" You're probably screwed in the long run. So, uh, you know, part of mm. the the marketing I think that needs to happen for the attack framework is how do you how do you sell it to people that do have that mindset that, uh, I, you know, I, I don't get all this, I don't understand this. 
this. And it's one thing to say, start somewhere, but there's a lot of people who are like, well, why, you know, I, I'm okay. Yeah. Cause I got my 20 boxes checked, but I think all of us would agree. Well, no, there's, <laughs> there's a need to do this. You know, the transcends whatever compliance or regulatory standards you have to follow. You're in business. You're trying to protect your, your, your own company, your, your, your customers, your users, you should be doing this just because how do we, how do we, how do we either market the attack framework or how do we use the attack framework to market the need for better security and better basic security hygiene? Yeah. Usually it's post breach that brings those people. Oh, yeah. That's what I was going to say yeah. was that typically you won't sell those people on it. If, if you go to, if you go to a small enterprise and you start trying to talk to them about this stuff and they're going, this is just not cost effective for us. We've got one person and that's just the way it's going to have to be. Mm. As soon as they get taken out, then they're calling back going, okay, tell us what to do now. Yeah. 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 And we've seen a lot of some, even bigger companies have a, a mindset of like, well, I'm going to go do this all myself. I'm going to get all this data. Yeah. I'm going to get this massive data lake. I'm going to use my SIM. And that that's even overwhelmed bigger companies. And mm -hmm. so for us, um, you know, our, our approach again has been to kind of try to make, make the stuff easy and accessible and do some of the heavy lifting, you know, uh, most of it really for our customers, give them a lot of flexibility in using the data, but also, for the, maybe the less sophisticated making you know, asking the right questions of the data and uh, and getting at the data you know really really easy and then getting that educational process in place i think you all you know hit on some really good points there um that for us at least our strategy in addressing that and helping our customers goes straight back to those um those imperatives we have in our product is you know make it make it easy make it accessible and educate the user awesome mark thank you so much for appearing on paul security weekly all right thanks so much for having me with that, we'll take a short break and come back with our next interview, so stay tuned.